Movies That Matter, the podcast about recent films going above and beyond the call of box office returns to boldly explore a social issue affecting people's lives. I'm your host, Nicole Finari, and with me today is... I'm Spencer Davis from the movie uh, website Shadows and Noise. Great. And this week we're going to overanalyze 20th Century Women. So during the summer of 1979, a Santa Barbara single mom and boarding house landlord, Annette Benning, decided that the best way she can parent her teenage son, Lucas Jade Zuman, is to enlist her young tenants, a quirky punk photographer, Greta Gerwig, a mellow handyman, Billy Crudup, and her son's shrewd best friend, Elle Fanning, to serve as role models in a changing world. So that's our plot summary. As always, kicking it off, what did you think of the movie? <laughs> well, I guess the first thing to warn about is just that this, I feel like this conversation really could end up being all over the place because the movie was all over the place. I mean, the name 20th Century Women makes you think that this is going to be a movie largely about gender issues, and it does touch a lot on that, but it's it's so much more ambitious than that in terms of talking about things like the generation gap. And in just life in general, that I almost feel like the movie ends up a little muddled as a result. I I didn't hate it. Like, I, I wasn't bored. I was sort of interested to see what was going to happen. But I found zero emotional connection with the movie. I came out of that surprised at all the rave reviews. I just, I, I didn't really connect to any of the people in any particular way. And I felt like... Um, the use of narration mm -hmm. really created a lot of emotional distance. Um, so it just, it very much didn't have any kind of like emotional impact on me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think we're on the same page there. I mean, had you, had, had you seen, um, Mike Mills' last movie, Beginners? I love Beginners. Really? Like it's, it's such a good movie about grief and the grieving mm -hmm. process. And this one just isn't a it's not a particularly good coming of age tale. I don't feel like the kid was any different from start to finish because only one person in the movie even emotionally invested in the kid. Like no one was what the mother. So the, in the plot, the mother asks her, her boarder who's about 24 mm -hmm. and his best friend who's 17 years old to his 15 years old to like co-parent with her and teach him about life in the world. And the 24-year-old actually tries to do that. And then the mom gets mad and shuts that down. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that this movie is hugely ambitious. And so it kind of almost, I feel bad for criticizing it in a way. But you're right, number one, that he that we don't really connect with the characters. And I thought that was actually a problem with Mike Mills' first movie, Beginners. Mm -hmm. Because... Um, he almost has this like Jim Jarmusch thing he likes to do where his actors are very stoic. There was less of that in this movie and I thought that helped, but it still hasn't come all the way to being a movie where you really connect with the characters and care what happens to them. You know, it's a very academic movie that I think is better at raising interesting questions than it is in answering anything. Yeah. I mean, and I felt like I, okay. So in the first scene where the the kid goes to LA with his friends and they have like the car with mm -hmm. the colors streaming out this like sort of 1970s Instagram filter. Right. I thought, Oh, they're all high. Okay. <laughs> I don't really like this, but fair enough. Yeah. But then every time somebody was driving, he used that. Yeah. And I was, I just thought this just looks very gimmicky. It didn't come off for me at all. The mix of the real photos in randomly of, of, from the 70s also mm -hmm. didn't just seemed gimmicky it didn't seem in service of the theme of the movie which is something he did in beginners also and i thought it worked a little bit better here in the sense of talking about um you know so much of the movie was about the differences and perceptions between the depression era generation the hippie generation of the 60s the punk generation of the late 70s early 80s and us as the audience so in a way, like flashing those on the screen served a certain intellectual point, but you're right. It feels gimmicky. And he used the same gimmick in a previous movie. So it's clearly just what he knows how to do. Yeah. 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 And I felt like, again, it just creates an emotional distance because it's this like still 
photo of something that, you know, I, I don't know, it just didn't, it didn't connect me to anything. And I noticed that a lot of the conversations people are having, he films where one person's head is kind of in the bottom corner of the screen mm -hmm. and it just focuses on the other person. Mm -hmm. So you don't actually see when people are having conversations, two people on screen actually relating to each other. Hmm. I didn't which, notice that, but yeah. And it's like, there's just, there's so many little techniques in it that create this emotional distance about a story that should be very emotional. Uh, I guess one of the first things I wanted to ask you about it, I mean, focusing back on the title and 20th Century Women, is I mean, what did you think of the way the movie characterized um, women in general and feminism more broadly? Um, well, I want to I want to get to some of the social issue stuff in a minute. But okay. I thought one of the things I liked about the movie, uh, I thought... The way it's set up, he gives you sort of these stereotypical characters where, you know, you have the hippie mom in her Birkenstocks, mm -hmm. the, the hippie carpenter who lived on a commune, you know, the punk artistic girl who needed to get out of her small town, and then sort of gives you more nuances to those stock mm -hmm. characters. It turns out the mom, despite all her hippie ways, is like seriously emotional withholding and not at all okay with sex. Mm -hmm. Um and the guy who lived on the commune actually hated living on the commune. So I thought that came off well, except for the teenage girl character, who I thought never gets beyond this cliche of acting out teenager and really has no... She was the most problematic character, and their relationship was extremely problematic to me in the movie. Yeah, there's a lot to dissect there. So, I mean, I think the first thing I would say is with regards to Annette Benning's character, I thought it was kind of funny. You mean, it, it, you described her as a hippie, and yes, that's the way they want her to appear at certain parts of the movie, but it doesn't quite add up because the whole time they're talking about how she's really a depression era child and she's, you know, constantly pulling up 1940s music and listening to it wistfully. And when she gets the 1940s car towards the end of the movie, mm -hmm. it's like this whole, so I mean, portraying her as a hippie when she really wasn't a hippie, it just seemed a little odd. Like, like it was muddled. Like they, he couldn't decide exactly what this character was supposed to stand in for, right? Right, I agree. And then, you know, she has the, like, flowy blouses and, the, again, the Birkenstocks. Yeah, she and Santa dresses Barbara. like one, right. But, and she's totally, she writes him excuses for to get out of school all the time. Mm. So she's, and she doesn't care that he stays out all night. So she has yeah. this sort of no rules, no boundaries approach to parenting until, except usually that character is played with being, you know, very an oversharing parent who's more of a friend than an actual parent whereas right. in her case she actually is draws a very firm boundary between herself and her son so that part i liked but at the same time the she was hor i mean i really disliked her as a character yeah i think it's because they were trying to have it both ways with her they couldn't really decide what she was supposed to be it felt like to me i mean and and i understand i mean i thought where the movie was successful with her character was in just portraying her as a mother so kind of the effort to shoehorn her into this hippie generation thing early on really didn't add up i mean really the emotional weight of the movie is in watching her try to deal with a son who she's worried she's losing and whose generation whose music whose culture she can't connect with at all um you know that was the power so in a way it would have been a better movie to me if she had just been a regular mom yeah i it had potential to be interesting mm -hmm. how withholding she was and what that dynamic was like. But then they, and then, and then they're, you know, towards the end, they have a, a moment where she actually talks to him like a real person. Right. And he says in the narration, I thought this was going to be a whole new relationship for us, but it wasn't. And right. I'm like, well, then what was the point of this movie? Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's what I mean. It's better at raising questions than answering them. You know, it does a lot of that where it seems like there's a really profound moment that it then just completely waves away by saying in the very next line, yeah, but none of this ended up mattering. <laughs> exactly. And I liked, again, I really liked uh, Greta Gerwig's character because she actually seemed to want to invest in the kid. She, mm -hmm. she wanted to make him a better person. And we'll get into, again, in the, in the second half, we'll talk about what that all meant. But from a movie point of view, her scenes with him were the most interesting to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think... The big controversy that I came out of this, I saw this movie with a friend and 
we ended up having a very, I don't know, wide ranging discussion about the Elle Fanning character and, and, you know, the, the sort of nice guy TM, he is like waiting, you know, he keeps pressuring her to have sex and she keeps being like, no, I'm not going to have sex with you. And then I actually like the scene where Greta Gerwig says, you have to, you know, you have to kick her out. If she's not going to sleep with you, then she shouldn't stay here. And it's very disempowering. But at the same time, it sort of sends this very male message that she owes him sex for him being her friend. So what was your take on that relationship so my take on that relationship is that i mean you know they do portray her as a very limited stereotype but i think they did it intentionally and it made sense for the movie because i mean basically she's a girl that holds herself out as being way more in the know than she really is she thinks she's super mature she's got life all figured out and it's very obvious to us the audience that she doesn't know anything and you know she's being selfish she's using this guy for the parts of the relationship that she needs, but she's not really willing to reciprocate. It's it's all about her. So yeah, and I don't see that. And I think that's that's how I I got frustrated because I've been in this situation before. And so, you know, she does that there's a scene where they're in bed and she's like, let's play therapy, let's talk about your relationship with your mom. Like it isn't portrayed and you know, the scenes where they're smoking together it isn't portrayed that she isn't giving anything back they do seem to have a genuine friendship and so that's not enough for him and that's not what he wants so he needs to walk away but the movie definitely plays it as she's the bad guy for not having sex with him i think she's the bad guy for more than just that Okay. And I think it's because she is dictating all of the terms of the relationship. So even in some of the examples you gave me, like where she's teaching him how to smoke or, you know, whatever, she, it's really about her trying to shape him into who she wants him to be. Okay. That's fine. And that's exactly what the person I saw the movie with said yeah. to me. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, she's been very upfront. The deal on the table is friendship sure. only. If he doesn't want that deal, then it's on him to walk away. Right. Not to him to pressure her into another deal. And I think then she she does the double cross where she sort of implies if they go on this trip, then she will sleep with him and then won't sleep with him in the end, mm -hmm. which I thought was very... That part does make her sort of the villain of the piece. And I was annoyed by it. I was frustrated by the portrayal that she's basically, it's implied that she does love him, but for whatever reason, she's not willing to be emotionally vulnerable enough to give him sex. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just thought it was utter, it, that whole thing was just utterly mishandled. It was a very male point of view about a woman who doesn't want to sleep with you I, or and you just have the the boys built a fantasy in his head that she really somehow does want to sleep with him despite the fact that she keeps saying no and if he just stays in it he's gonna get sex i do think this is a movie where men and women are gonna see certain parts of it differently and i think that's i mean that's to be expected and to me a lot of that stems from i mean the very interesting notion that you have mike mills a man who wrote and directed a movie called 20th century women that ostensibly is supposed to be speaking to these issues. And I mean, that's what I thought when I watched this is, you know, I mean, frankly, that takes some balls for him to even try that. But, and I don't know that he succeeded on a number of levels. Um, I didn't find his portrayal of women unsuccessful other than the teenage girl. I didn't have yeah. a problem with the mother or the other girl. I just, I found that uh, the girl just, he he it was it was very much like him looking back on that type of character in a very uncritical way mm -hmm. versus it's it's almost as if each of the women was coming from his that time of life for him so it's like at 24 if he met another 24 year old he probably had some emotional maturity to see her as more of a fully realized person than he did remembering what he girls were like at 15 i think that's a very good point actually yeah uh there, you know, the, the, the character of the son is, is, uh, really that, that whole storyline between him and Elle Fanning is getting at the whole nice guy 
right. uh, issue, which, you know, I mean, I can tell you firsthand having experienced it that I identified with the son character for some of the issues he dealt with, you know, including with that girl. Um, I wouldn't characterize, I think that's why I didn't see it as purely a sexual thing. I think I viewed it as some of his anger with her stemmed from the fact that basically he felt like she was holding him to a different standard than the rest of men, you know, because she does sleep around. She is very open about the fact that she's having sex with all these other guys that treat her badly. And so he's thinking, okay, then how come the one guy that treats you well and honestly cares about you as a human being and that's the one person you don't want to sleep with? I mean, I understand that to a limited a limited extent, you know? Yeah. And this is, it's, it's a gray area and yeah. different people have different perspectives on this. And, uh, you know, is, is, is his inability to just say no to her, her fault or his fault or both of their fault? I, I, I think it's both. I think yeah. that's the fair reading of it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, First and foremost, completely inappropriate from the for the mother to ask a seventeen year old girl to like co parent her kid. Sure. So I just was like, that was weird. I didn't. I for a while I thought she was supposed to be older than that. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. Um. Did you, now, let me ask you this? Did you think that the problems with this whole storyline we've been discussing maybe would have been mitigated if Elle Fanning's character had been more three dimensional? If there had been something more to her, I mean, that, I think hers was the most narrowly constructed character. Greta Gerwig's character kind of has more going on in her life. She seems more like a real human being. Yeah, I think it would have. And I think, again, it's like what he remembers 17 year old girls were mm-hmm. like, as opposed to him knowing 17 year old girls now and knowing what they're like. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was like his recreation from his teenage mind of what girls were like. Right. And it comes across like she's a very shallow yeah. character. Um, but I don't think, I don't know how you could have written her that it would be remotely appropriate for the mother to have been like, you need to teach my son about life. Like, no. <laughs> right, right. There's That just would never have been okay. Well, and I think the storyline we've been discussing is probably the most interesting part of the movie, too, because people can see it different ways. But also, I mean, it gets into these broader issues that are really relevant today with, you know, the strength of the women's movement and, and you know, we're about to have a march on Washington on these issues. And, and it's an exciting time for this. But, you know... I think it's interesting to discuss from the standpoint of a man talking with a woman who is a strong feminist, the difficult, thorny issues that arise for men who want to be better, who want to be feminists. Yeah, I mean, so that's definitely why I I was excited to, to watch this movie with you, because sure, we've talked a lot about, you know, feminism, what's going on with women's issues, but despite the name of the movie, this movie is supposed to be about a man. And it's, you know, we have, I haven't reckoned on this podcast with like, what does it mean to be a man in the mm-hmm. modern world? Like, mm-hmm. um, I reread the Han Rosen article, the end of men mm-hmm. before this. <laughs> and so I have strong feelings on that article. Go, <laughs> yeah. We'll lay them out. Go for it. No, no. Uh, what, what, what were you going to say about it? No, just that I reread it and, and, and it, it very much, you know, the old school feminism just looked at what was going to happen with women and, you know, newer forms of feminism definitely is trying to create this gender neutral world and figure out where men's place is in it. And I don't think, I think we're in a time of deep transition. Yeah. Yeah. And it's rough on both women and men because of that. I mean, there are the men who are out there trying like this character in the movie to be better men to really, you know, read and learn about things from a woman's perspective, recognizing that it's not right, that that's been ignored for so long. But, you know, at the same time, engaging with that can be a double-edged sword for him because it's almost like by trying your imperfections, your the places where you still fall short stand out that much more. I think he kind of ran into that a few times in the movie where he almost kind of gets slapped back for his efforts to kind of try and engage. I mean, the movie to me seems like it to, to your previous point speaks better to the gender roles that women force on men than vice versa, which is what we, I think thought it was going to be about going in. Mm -hmm. 
did you did you relate to his struggle? Did you find, you know, the I so I was thinking back on on what you said, like how how the how the movie defines a man. Um, the teenage girl defines a man as what does she say? Strength is the only thing. Like men are never allowed to be vulnerable, yeah. which is actually for the youngest character the most sort of regressive view mm-hmm. of of male manhood maleness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the example of of the the mechanic is of a man who just is totally passive, just lets life happen to him and takes no initiative. Yeah. Um, the mom. I can't remember if you remember. Tell me, she says she's talking about her ideal man, like Humphrey Bogart in the next life, and she's mm-hmm. like, "He knows what I'm thinking," which is such a cliche for women. Yeah. Um, and he's like reliable. He's always there when I need him, or he does what he says he's gonna do. And then I can't remember what the third thing was. Right. So you get all these different views of what a man should be. Well, yeah, I think I did identify with um, the younger character in the movie. um, And I saw little things throughout about, you know, just from my own experiences of gender roles. I mean, so as background, I was, you know, raised uh, by my mother in a single household with my older sister who's 10 years older. So I was kind of raised in a somewhat similar environment, a you know, I, I saw my dad a lot, but, you know, he was not living at home with me. Very so, similar to Mike Mills, actually. You really? Okay. Yeah. So he actually was has an older sister as well. Okay. Yeah. So. Which I wonder if the uh, Greta Gerwig character. Which hasn't appeared in any in movie. There. Yeah. No, I wondered if it There's was a little her. bit of that vibe. Yeah. That even reminded me at times of my relationship with my sister back in those days. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Because... It's nice She's not a beginner's either. <laughs> right. And it's nice to have the older sister to teach you how to be cool. Yeah, you know? so, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I so I saw a lot of that in terms of like you know, said, I ne- definitely thought of 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 Elle Fanning telling him that he needs to focus first and more foremost on strength as is the dominant male characteristic and can't be vulnerable. And of course I thought of things like Mad Men during that scene where, you know, I think Don Draper has really revived a set of expectations around that for this generation that had kind of died out for a generation. I mean, if you go back and watch like the movies and the romantic comedies of the eighties and nineties, most of the women characters are talking about, they're complaining. Why can't I find a man who's really in touch with his feelings? Who can Oh yeah. The sensitive nineties man. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's, that's gone. Grew up in. That's gone. I mean, that's like now I think a lot of women, you know, I've experienced this in dating and I've experienced this in pop culture. Uh, they want to return to the Don Draper days right now. It's just kind of, we've, the pendulum has swung the other way a little bit. That could be true. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, it's as played out in the election, like we've 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 left behind a generation of men who no longer feel relevant. So the mm. end of the article, the end of men talks about how in the ec- economically, like it's the end of men because they're not men are falling behind in educational achievement. And that seems to be the key to upper mobility in today's economy in America. And, you know, they're losing the industries that are shutting down are all male dominated industries. And they're not but they're not willing to become nurses or teachers Mm -hmm. or go into service industry jobs. So they just are left with nothing like they're failing to adapt to the world around them is sort of the premise of the article. That's a good point because it's playing out differently at different generations. I think what's interesting is that our younger generation is kind of being uh is i mean i think the humphrey bogart description of the perfect man is probably coming back into vogue now Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas maybe cary grant was the (laughs) perfect man for a period there you know so um cary grant will always be the perfect (laughs) man (laughs) fair enough i'm not gonna argue that point um but uh you know i thought kind of uh one of the other interesting things the movie did with uh kind of enforcing uh gender roles upon men was the way uh billy crudup's character was characterized like you know this is a guy you know he's he's a hippie he's obviously portrayed as like seen as being the masculine man though even if on the inside he really is about you know things like studying feminism and and meditation and learning how to make ceramic bowls is what he wants on the inside but But he's a mechanic on the outside he's a mechanic on the outside and all the women interestingly treat him pretty much purely as a sex object yes 
which was a fascinating kind of reversal of expectations from what we normally see in movies. I mean, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. his whole problem is, you know, I mean, he's a guy, he's not trying to be a womanizer. He wants a deeper connection with women. And, you know, it shows it through a montage in which these women come have sex with him and then basically bail on him. And, you know, he's wanting them to stick around and have a meaningful connection with them. And so I thought that was actually pretty fascinating and, and a good way of showing that maybe not all stereotypes hold up all the time. Yeah. Um, I, I, but then the part is that, you know, he's just so passive about it. It's like, cause he never chooses the women. He lets them and choose him and then not choose him. Yeah. And that's part of the issue. But I, I, you know, this, this generation of men, I very rarely meet a man who can't cook. Right. right. So somewhere along the lines, like I, I do think there's a failure to teach men to sew, but maybe that's just my limited data sample of men. But I think it's funny because it's like the the old idea that a man was going to go right from his mother's household to his wife's household right. has has been overturned. And men have learned how to be independent and how to do household things like laundry and but maybe not so on a button. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm very proud to say that I taught myself to sew on a coat button uh, two years ago. I did it once. If I ever needed to do it again, I'd have to look up a YouTube video again. I did not retain the knowledge. <laughs> That's but hilarious. This is progress. <laughs> that might be the best, the most, <laughs> the best like uh, symbol of the modern man is like, yeah. well, I didn't know how to do it because yeah. so I YouTubed it. Like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> That would There's probably be true YouTube. of fixing a car or anything else, too. So oh, absolutely. To absolutely. Um, but do you, I mean, do you sort of worry about the future of men? Are you concerned? No. no, no. I mean, I think that, you know, our roles are constantly changing vis-a-vis one another. I think that um, women are coming into hopefully a very good time for them. And I think that has dividends to pay for men, too. I mean, are we coming to the end of the period where uh, essentially the patriarchy uh, benefits men uniquely? I mean, I don't know if I want to make that bold of a pronouncement either, although I think we make constant progress at it. We're chipping away at it bit by bit, this year's election results notwithstanding. I mean, yeah, I think this, well, again, she won by three million votes, so yeah. there's that aspect. But I think, yeah, I mean, to me, this year's election's results are the sort of last gas. Yeah. Of, of, of a set of men. Um, but at the same time, you know, more single parenthood. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I think one of the things that came up in this whole zeitgeist about the end of men was, did you read that letter the mom had written for the Princeton newspaper? Her two sons were at Princeton and she wrote this letter to the women of Princeton basically saying, I can't believe you won't date my sons. You're making a huge mistake because let me tell you, there aren't that many college educated, high achieving men anymore. And if you leave Princeton without locking them down right now, you're going to enter a world where there's much fewer of them. And you won't have as easy access, and then you're not going to be able to marry the high status man of your dreams. All I have to say is, as a person with a mom who does not respect boundaries, I hope she's not listening to this podcast yeah. because that terrifies me that she could be presented such ideas. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing was it was a very it was a very much couched in this these political terms. At the same time, it was basically a mom bitching that no one will date her kids. Like, inappropriate and, and talk talk about you know making the problem worse i mean i'm sure all the women out there once they know these boys have a mom like that are just going to be racing to sign up right yes exactly <laughs> yeah that's the kind of mother-in-law you want yeah. um but i think what what bothered me so much about it was that it it's very hard actually to be a power couple right mm-hmm. like you look at the obamas and I think that Michelle Obama did a tremendous job as first lady. I think she gave Eleanor Roosevelt a real run for her money in that job. Mm -hmm. But let's face it, like she had to put her career aside to follow her husband. That was the only thing that she could do in that scenario. And in that scenario where it's very hard to support two careers at the same time and two sets of extremely high ambitions, 
what is so wrong with all these Princeton women finding a nice plumber who's highly mobile, can do their job anywhere, always in demand, and then she can go do her high-flying career and become CEO, right? Like, it it almost has to work that someone has to choose. So the premise of the article was that the women were just going to set themselves back because they weren't going to find this high-achieving man. I sort of thought, but a high-achieving woman may not want or need a high-achieving man. Yeah. Yeah, I think the quick answer is that there's nothing wrong with what you said. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that our generation views relationships and marriages in, in in a fascinatingly different way than our parents' generation did, right? Our parents were the last generation where they really viewed a marriage as two people becoming one, mm-hmm. right? You know, the way there's little subtle signs of it, the way at the end of a wedding, they'd say Mr. and Mrs. and then say the man's name, right? The, the way they handle things like the bank account, right? Uh, the way, you know, all of our money is considered one pot, right? And our generation, I think, views relationships and marriages more as partnerships between equals at least, I mean, it's not an absolute, but it's much more notable in comparison with previous trends. I mean, most people I know who are married have, like, they, they might have a joint account, but they also have separate accounts. They kind of recognize that you have to, to be in a successful relationship. You both have to be willing to do certain things together, but also have your time apart and your time where you can engage in your individual interests. Um, I think it really is a generational difference. I think so too. And I think, but I think that there are men who do not accept that deal. And then that becomes very problematic for them. I mean, it's, they don't want that new role, Mm -hmm. which I often felt was one of the things I knew a few women who basically just wanted to be like, housewives when they grew up i know a lot of women that way and i thought that's great and i feel bad for men who like want that too in the sense of like they don't want to work like they don't like work they don't want to do it they want to be able to be supported by someone but there's not a like a thing that a man can say he wants to do now he can say he wants to be a house husband but you know back in the day you couldn't just say i don't want to work i want someone to support me and that doesn't seem fair yeah um and so it it shouldn't it shouldn't work that way. I mean, I think men should have the opportunity to be supported by someone else if they want to, if they can find the person who's willing to take that deal. Um, so, but I, I don't know. I don't know. The, the, the naysayers, the, the gloom and doom people say, no, what's ended up happening is that just nobody gets married and people are not actually figuring this out. And I, you know, I don't know if, I mean, that is true statistically, whether that continues to be true. I mean, you had the the huge spike in divorce, right, after mm-hmm. the women's movement in the 70s and 80s, which is very, very much plateaued off. Right. You know, it's like everybody got out of their bad marriage and then it, it you know, like yeah. people stopped getting divorced so much. So um, whether this is a, is a trend towards, you know, marriage being over, I don't know, or, or men not being able to work ever. I'm not sure. I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that our generation has waited until later to get married. Yeah, I mean, so you know, previously, gener- you know, generations would uh, people get married right out of high school or at the best right out, out of college. And that, that still goes on in some areas of the country. I mean, I'm, I'm from the South and you see it's much more prevalent there than it is here. But I think that now people wait until an age where they know themselves better before they get married and that pays dividends with the, you know, declining divorce rates. I mean, but it's only people like us getting married, though. That's the issue. There's very much a class component to all of this absolutely. in that, you know, you look at how it's interesting to me. You look at how black communities were completely decimated and the social ills that that brought um, and with, you know, and the and the, the scare text and how horrified everybody was with the rise of the single mother in the black community. Well, the exact same thing is now happening to the white community as, you know, men became unemployed and, and, you know, the economic crisis just has devolved into a quote unquote social crisis where people aren't getting married and there's a lot of children born out of wedlock. Now, whether or not you think that's a crisis or a problem is somewhat of a separate issue, but it does, I mean, this movie... I think solidly comes down 
Well, you can say, do you think this movie comes down on the side that he really needed a male figure in his life or he didn't? I think it comes down on the side that it, he didn't. I mean, that okay. was that's where the characters seem to think at the beginning. But the bottom line is one never comes along and it suggests that he's going to be just fine. He's just going to be different than previous generations of men. And that was true for okay. that whole age range. Okay. I think the interesting point to me was just how all these gender issues and generational issues end up tying together in the movie. And I mean, the truth is these institutions you and I are talking about, like marriage and relationships and male gender roles and female gender roles, they've been constantly evolving through all of human society. I mean, I remember when the whole gay marriage debate was going on and you heard people saying marriage has always been X. And it's like, well, marriage hasn't always been anything. I mean, you used to be able to marry your cousins. You used to have arranged marriages. You used to get married at age 13. You used to not be able to marry someone from a different race or a different religion. So this notion that it has always been this one thing is just laughable when you understand history. And I thought what this movie did well, at least in terms of the, I guess, the narrow aspects of gender roles that it tries to explore, is uh, looking at it from kind of a st- standing back uh, uh, generational uh, viewpoint, right? It, we're, we're viewing it after the fact. We're viewing it as history. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, you know, there's these... Uh, what we call them narrations that skip forward to tell us what happens after all of this. And you have the nice little touch like Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, speech on the uh, crisis, crisis of, of confidence. confidence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all these things kind of remind you that all this is playing out against the backdrop of history and it's always changing. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. Um, and I agree. I hate when people have no sense of history. So to that end, um, we come to our impact score, which I will explain for new listeners. Uh, the impact score goes from 1 to 10. 1 being this movie was not at all socially relevant and no one will see it. And 10 being life and movies as we know it is forever altered in the landscape. Um, so after your discussion about the sense of history, I'm like, oh, I kind of want to bump up my impact score. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you, you made a good case for it having a bigger impact. Um, I mean, it's getting a lot of good buzz. I mean, people yeah. who like movies are seeing it. I don't think it's going to pass into the mainstream. Uh, so I was going to give it maybe three or four. I think it had some interesting things to say about the role of men and the role of women. Um, but... I think, again, I think you're completely right in saying more questions than actual answers. Yeah, I mean, I think I tend to see this, the social impact score a little more optimistically than you do. So, I, I mean, I would give it a six. I guess it aspires to be a ten, clearly. I mean, it has these very bold aspirations. that are The, the gimmicky over. colors with the cars thing yeah. is going to keep it way out, out of the over five range for me just because I found that so annoying. And I don't want anyone to ever imitate that cinematically. Yes, yes. It was kind of annoying after a while. Um, I, I think, you know, it, whether it's a six, whether it's a four, it, it, the reason it falls that low isn't because it's not trying to engage important mm-hmm. issues, but because it's uh, kind of doing them in a muddled way. Fair enough. Okay. Any uh, recommendations? Yeah, I've got two. Uh, one that I thought of was uh, the 1939 movie, The Women. Which um, oh, based on the play, yeah, yeah. Which if you haven't seen it, I mean, that's just an important piece of cinematic history. I mean, it stars it was an all star cast at the time: uh, Joan Crawford, Rosalind Russell, Joan Fontaine, Norma Shearer, Paula Goddard. And the the catch here is it was a women a movie made with a, a literally all female cast. Um, there wasn't a single man, not even in the background, in the entire movie. Now it doesn't exactly pass the Bechdel test because. Almost all these women end up talking about <laughs> is men. the men in their lives and competing over them and whatever. But it was revolutionary in its time. And I think it's a movie where you see Hollywood making an early attempt to engage the gender problem. Um, and the other one I thought of actually was from last year. Um, Everybody Wants Some, which was uh, Richard Oh, you know, I didn't Blair's. see that. It's a great movie. And it's specifically a great movie. It, it's not upfront about this, but there's got a lot of great subtle commentary on male gender roles. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, these guys looking to conform and 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 how they're actually a lot de- it's about a bunch of male jocks at a 1980 uh, uh, small college in Texas and it's, it kind of defies a lot of the stereotypes but only slowly you start to unpeel these guys and realize that they're a little more complicated and a little more thoughtful and that the dumb jock persona is really something that's kind of uh, 
foisted upon them. So Cool. Um, my recommendation is a book for this podcast. I just finished Jason Diamond's Searching for John Hughes. Mm. Um, and I, it, it's a, you know, for those of us who are sort of, I guess you would say Spencer and I are in that awkward no man's land of, of Gen X versus millennial. We're sort of born in between them. I like to think we're Gen Y, but. Yeah. So, but for, for those of us who are Gen X enough that John Hughes movies meant something to us at the time, um, it's a good, it's a good book about what movies do and how portraying a certain piece of America in a certain way really impacted one person's life. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Movies That Matter. If you did, take, please take a second to leave a review on iTunes and stay till the end of this podcast because I have a special call for help for the musicians slash composers out there in the world. Uh, if you want to talk to me, you know, you can always go to the website, www.moviesthatmatter.com. I'll leave a comment. Um, there's a contact us page and I'm at Funarini on Twitter. And you can reach me, Spencer Davis, at uh, Shadows and Noise, on uh, the Shadow, Shadows and Noise uh, Twitter handle. Great. Remember, movies matter. And so do you. We'll see you next time. Movies That Matter is looking to update the intro and outro music used on the show. If you'd like to send a recording of original music, please go to the website, moviesthatmatterpodcast.com, and use the form to contact me. You would be credited on the show and on the website for your contribution. Remember, movies matter, and so does music.